You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode 158 of Arsenal Pass. Hayden Dow, Brendan Patrick, as always. And uh, hey, Brendan, we're just talking about movies before we hopped on. We went and saw the same movie this past week or weekend. I actually don't know when it came out in, in the US, but we went and saw Civil War. That was very what good else have you seen lately? Uh, what else have I seen? I saw Dune. I probably should have seen Monkey Man instead of Civil War. Civil War, um, obviously, like you hit, like, I don't know. Maybe people, that's like a politically charged movie. It's not. Um, but I ultimately am a big fan of the director. His name is Alex Garland. He wrote a, a novel. And writer. I'm, yeah, and writer. He wrote a novel I'm a big, big fan of. It's called The Beach. Um, don't read it because, I don't know, you might quit your job and go. I don't know, exploring. It's it's a great, it's really a great book. To be honest, it's one of the only books I've had, I've picked up and it just could not put it down. Um, he did Annihilation as well. But uh, yeah, Civil War, it was okay. It was okay. It, it had this, like, there was an idea, there was definitely an idea he had for the film, which is like the, the, it kind of, the images tell the story, right? Like, there's not a lot mm. that's told to you, but ultimately, for me, it kind of felt like there wasn't enough substance there, which is okay. Um but I was surprised because when I think of Alex Garland, I think of like a very substantive story. So that's why I think that was the disconnect with me. Like like uh, Ex Machina and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Like he also did, I mean, we can say he did Annihilation, but ultimately his magnus op- magnum opus is probably Ex Machina at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I really like Alex Garland as well. And for those that haven't watched any of his movies or read any of the things he's written or watching the movies he's written for that. For that yep. um, but i i mean i i really like the idea i just think yeah the execution was kind of lacking a little bit i mean i'm also a really big fan of 28 days later which he also wrote danny boyle directed but um he's a really yeah, he's a anyway. really really smart person i've read some of the others like i've seen some of his podcasts yeah. and interviews and i've been really i was really impressed like he wrote that that novel the beach when he was very young from what i understand and uh, yeah, i think he was like 20 something when he wrote it yeah i actually think it's one of the best books of all time it, like it it won't change your life but it is just one of the most entertaining and like it is a pretty deep and meaningful book at the same time. I, I if I ever recommend someone a book agnostic of genre, like I don't know what they're into, I don't know what they like, it's always the beach. Actually, it's like my yeah, number one I recommendation. Just wouldn't, I just wouldn't bother watching the movie to be honest. But um, oh yeah, I haven't seen it. I heard it's a cult classic, Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, but I've it's never actually seen decent. It. Okay, okay, but I don't think it does the book enough justice. Last thing I'll say on Alice Garland is my favorite, one of my favorite movies, and one of my favorite Alice Garland movies is Sunshine, which is another Danny Boyle directed movie. If you're looking for like if you like space movies oh, really? and you like stuff in the kind of interspe- interstellar kind of like scape of things, you should go check out Sunshine. Oh. Uh, I can massively recommend that. I have to write that down. I, I okay, like, okay. I like all those things. What? I had no idea right, this, right. this was a movie. <laughs> well, for those that don't care about movies, <laughs> welcome to the podcast this week. We're going to be talking about this new metagame. Dromai is officially gone. Goodbye. Honestly, I've said this before about other heroes. Kind of good riddance. Like, I played a lot of Dromai. Last year, I played it at, at, at Nationals. Uh, I played it at um, Calling Taipei, Calling Melbourne. I ended up playing at Worlds. And then I f- ended up playing it uh, at the PT this year. So, I played a lot of Dromai. I really enjoyed my time playing Dromai. And if you've listened to the pod regularly, you'll know, I mean, before they printed Time Imperial Flame, um, which Brendan is sick of me saying. But, um, yeah, I'm going to say a little bit of good rinse to, to Dromai, I think. And it's super interesting what I think this is going to do to the metagame. Uh, we're going to talk full full meta breakdown. We don't do tier lists, right, Brendan? But we're going to go through every hero in the format and groups and kind of just talk through what are the best decks, what are not the best decks, what you may or may not want to play for ProQuest. I, they're not really tiers, but um, we, should, I guess we should do tiers. Okay, I was seeing we'll all, all this content. Listen. I was seeing all this content that's coming. Out. I was like, damn, we got. I guess I guess we just got to give in. We got to start doing tier lists. By the way, I apologize if I cough. I'm actually like, I'm so sick right now. I. I think for the past five years, I've only ever had colds, and like this is the first time I have like a proper sinus and chest infection, like with the like coughing up all the stuff. It's lasted like seven days. I'm just getting my ass kicked. Yeah, that's rough. I do think someone's going to go back and cut into the into all the times where Brendan said I don't get sick, but <laughs> yeah, I you know what? I actually, to be fair, I have realized that about myself that I do say I don't get sick, and then I'm like, fuck, is this like the second time this year? <laughs> Bit of a psyop. Uh, Bit of a psyop. <laughs> uh, let's talk this week of Flesh of Blood quickly. I mean, apart from us watching 
some movies. <laughs> um, I'm about to head off to travel for a couple of weeks for for work. Two but, weeks, huh? So, two weeks away from home. Yeah, two and a, two and a bit weeks. Yeah, I'm going to miss the ProQuest season. I'm actually going to try and play a ProQuest um, while I'm traveling. So I'm mm. trying to line up where that might be at the moment. I'd love to play a ProQuest. I actually, we're going to talk about this. I have no clue what deck I want to play, honestly. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been putting out some some content. If you hadn't already seen it, uh, you can go. Brendan's been doing a few deck techs. You can see we've got Matt Dilk's deck tech. We've got uh, Joel Raptor. So Joel Raptor, top four at the PT KO deck tech. We've got Matt Dilk's calling winner. Uh, on Kasai plus up on Patreon. As always, we have full written guides on both those. Thanks to Joel and and Matt. Uh, and I love I watching. I love both these these deck techs. If you haven't seen them, you should definitely check them out on our YouTube. But I love when Brendan at the end of the Matt Dilks interview says, uh, "You know, where can people find you?" And he's like, yeah. <laughs> you, I, "You can't." And yeah. I only do this for the Arsenal Fast Boys. <laughs> I knew that was coming. To be honest, I felt like I had to do it, but I was like, I, I, I was like, there is. He definitely does have an answer for this, but I, I'm interested to see what he comes up with. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely check out the deck techs. I'm happy they're able to join us. It's cool to be able to um, utilize the larger PCG Pass team uh, in order to help us do these deck techs. Both players are just fantastic, uh, very talented, and yeah, they did a really good job both in the deck techs and the additional pieces with sideboard guys, tips and tricks, all that good stuff. Uh, so be sure yeah. to check it out on YouTube. I think we might have a couple more coming uh, as well, but Hayden will have more information on that. I have one question for you, Hayden. Do you usually do mm. like two week plus stints when you travel or is it usually shorter? Uh, no, it's usually about two two weeks or so. Yeah, it's not ideal, but try and, you know, like it is far to travel from Australia internationally. So my, I, I worked this out. You'll love this, Brendan. This will make you so happy because you love flying and you love airports. Oh, yeah. But I'm going to spend nearly 70 hours in planes and airports over the next uh, two class, weeks. So. You fly business? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a big difference. Still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree it sucks, but flying business is like, it's just so different. Um, yeah, the difference is, is, is significant. So they have you like, li- like, I don't know where you're going, but do you kind of, you just have a hotel and you kind of live at that office for a couple of weeks, wherever you are? Yeah, so I'm out like a, a lot of meetings um, and then I've got a week kind of in a uh, home office in, in Boston, which I've never been to before. So I'm super, super keen to that. I've never been to Boston before. I'm, I'm trying to go to, I'm going to be going to a Red Sox game on the Friday. Um, if you live in Boston, hey, um, hit me up. I'm looking, looking forward to it. Just a renaissance, man. <laughs> um, I mean, not much to talk about in the news. I just wanted to cover the deck techs if you haven't seen them. There's um, this, this some good content out at the moment. I On the Fab TCG website, Arthur Trahey, Pro Tour winner, wrote an article about pitch stacking, which is very brief, but I think it's very it's very good. I, I would recommend checking it out, if, especially if you kind of haven't really covered the concept of pitch stacking before and you want a nice soft introduction as opposed to some of these videos that go super deep on how you pitch stack Kano and you want a bit more of a broad kind of understanding of pitch stacking, I would go and check out that article. I, I think it's a, a really good piece of of um, running content. Yeah. Jacob Pearson, your boy. Uh, it's your boy, Jacob Pearson. He did a deck tech on Prism as well up on the Fab TCG YouTube channel. It's interesting to see their new content strategy. So there's mm-hmm. one thing that has always been consistent about Flesh and Blood TCG content from the publisher is that it's inconsistent. So I'm interested to see if they've actually pivoted to, to like a real content model now, because it looks like they're, they've increased production value. They definitely have a graphic designer. Um, and it seems like they're actually investing in it this time. So I wonder if they have like a legit kind of content pipeline they're going to be consistently servicing throughout the year of, of Flesh and Blood. I think probably now. I think they always tried to get it up and running and maybe didn't have the right people behind it, but now they seem to, and, and the production value also is, is quite high. So yeah. I, can, I yeah. got a little, bit, the- a little tidbit of lore for people. Um, so the Devastation, so they did this thing called Devastation. <laughs> the devs played against each other um, with decks. And one time, um, I won't name who it was, but I'll name who was <laughs> playing. It was uh, Jason Chung. And I think it was Jacob Pearson. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're playing against each other. Chain versus Bolton. Chain versus Bolton. And they uploaded the YouTube video with the mics hot. Which was a fucking without mess. the commentary, they yeah. uploaded the raw, the big, raw footage. Big yeah. mistake. So these guys were unfiltered and <laughs> I just remember my fucking Dante got the link. Um, I think they unlisted. I don't even know if they took it down initially, but my, Dante got the link, and it was uh, it was intense. It, it was pretty funny. It was it was absolutely not not the intention to upload the the raw mic'd up version. Um, but yeah, you got you got a little bit of insight on what in what developer talk sounds like. You know, 
It was pretty funny because we, we were saying, you know, at that point, we we're like, I mean, chain is just broken. Like, it's just yeah. not even close. And they're playing chain into Bolton. And then uh, J- Jason is playing chain. He's like, I really wanted to lose this match <laughs> as chain. And Jacob's like, yeah, Bolton usually has a good matchup into chain. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Jason times. destroyed him. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's keep going. Commander Cookout this week. Okay. So, Commander Cookout this week comes from... Dr. Runks or Drunks, who I actually got to meet at PTLA. So, shout out to the man that is Dr. Runks slash Drunks. Uh, got to meet briefly at PTLA, came and said hello. So, shout out to you. Two part of question here. What would be your preferable pack and pick that you would be too late to pivot and draft this is? I.e., how long would you like to be able to stay open and draft? And B, what do you think is, what do you think that is designed to be in heavy hitters by LSS? Mm. It's interesting. So is this at, let me just kind of clarify this question. Is this asking what's the latest I would reasonably pivot or what's the latest I would want to be What's your ideal? What's your ideal? Yeah. What's on the wheel for sure. hundred percent on the wheel. That's that's probably assuming bigger packs. Yeah. Assuming bigger packs. I would like, I would like the, the set to be designed in a way that you don't get heavily punished for pivoting on the wheel when you get information back from the rest of your pod. I mean, it doesn't matter how big the pack is, right? I think it's just, it just comes down to how, like, we don't have to worry about design here. Alice can design it however they want to make sure that you get what you want and you want to be able to be able to pivot until what? So basically pick nine, you're saying like at the wheel and then maybe one pick after that, you maybe. Yeah, I, I think that that might be solved with 30 card decks if there was a maximum in draft. Uh, I, again, I don't know the ramifications of that mm-hmm. because it's been like it's been just dismissed every time I bring it up. So it's probably more complicated, but uh, if there was like a maximum deck size, I think that you could pivot a lot later. Cause right now, if yeah, you, you even think could, yeah, it, right now, if you pivot, um, it might be objectively correct. Like I, when I pivoted in the pro tour, I was a solo guardian. So like, is mm-hmm. it correct? Is it not? But the, the issue is, is that especially in where, the, where there's attrition based gameplay, um, you, you just need a massive opportunity cost for not having even two to three extra cards in your deck sometimes. Um, and, yeah. and that feels bad because you know, you, you could be making a pivot to where you're actually the solo player of that class and still get punished for it. I think where pivoting has been at its strongest is we've been able to pivot into power so pivoting in formats where card quantity and deck density matters so honestly like the last couple of sets outsiders um bright lights almost forgot about that set uh and heavy hitters heavy hitters maybe slightly less but honestly it is it is kind of punishing to pivot especially later than like pick four or five where maybe you're giving up like if you have to give up more than two to three cards that's really significant so you know obviously there's a staying open thing because that's basically pivoting versus and at what point you do it can depend on the cards you have right so you know if you're staying a bit more open with these flexible cards equipments generics hybrids whatever it is multi-class cards talented cards then okay it's a little bit of a difference so in theory that's why i say you know maybe 14 cards is fine maybe they can do it that way with the design design philosophy it depends but i would say like an uprising was the last time that you actually got kind of decently rewarded for pivoting i think and that was a three hero set i'd love to see that kind of how Mm -hmm. You can get more rewarded in a four class set, uh, I think. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I I want to see as we get more sets because I do think heavy hitters was a set that was designed with um, you know attrition in mind and actually trying to avoid mm-hmm. those strategies, but it was still extremely prominent and, in my opinion, extremely powerful. I wonder if just the collective strategy of the flesh and blood community has evolved a bit to where mm-hmm. you know what we experienced in, even in uprising because that's that's not that long ago was. You know, people potentially just not understanding um, deck damage as well and attrition based strategies. And maybe, you know, if we did go back to uprising, you would still feel like you would still be punished quite heavily for for pivoting and stuff like that. That's what I wonder. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of like zero fours and also this wizard. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that just on this, what the question in terms of where I would want to pivot, I, I think, I think I mostly agree with Brendan. I think I would like to. I would like staggered kind of pivot opportunities based on probably how the set is designed. So let's say like um, it's a let's just take heavy hitters for instance. So you have you have hybrid cards in, in each of the the three potential wedges, right? So I would like the opportunity I think to pivot out of like into I guess into a a two wedge piece. So I would like the opportunity probably might 
let me put it this way. Things get shut down. What I'd like to see is things get shut down. So your pivot gets later and later, gets narrower and narrower. So let's say from like pick four to five, it's like clear that you can't go into one wedge. So a hero or a class potentially gets cut off. And then you go into the next kind of phase of that where it's like, okay, after this, you um, you now get cut off uh, into like one particular wedge. So two heroes open, but you're you're getting cut of like another wedge. So this probably works more on four heroes as well. I like the idea of four hero, uh, four class rather. And then eventually you get the wheel and it's like, okay, slam like the guardians open or whatever. And I was guardian warrior. And I, I think there's that kind of aspect already in heavy hitters, but you just can't, you can't see it through. Like if you do it on the wheel, it's just too late. Like you don't have the card quality. Oh, yeah, You're 1, probably giving up. Like 100%. I would like to be able to ideally give up like two to three, four, probably four cards, honestly, that just won't make my deck in the first pack. And it honestly feels like in heavy hitters, you can give up like two to three max mm -hmm. and i want it to be more like four to five so i think the pivot point right now in heavy hitters is like honestly i think picks five to six i think if you're pivoting at six that's that's late i think that's gonna be tough i think alice has designed it to be <laughs> honestly i think alice has designed it to be like on the wheel and i just don't think that's how it's played out but interesting yeah it could be due to ignorance but honest anytime i pivot in heavy hitters draft it feels bad to me um like at, at any point, like I just want as many, like for the most part, I want as many playable cards as possible. And yeah, I just feel like often, uh, even if I'm pivoting like pick four, I'm just like, I just feel like I'm getting punished. Not that it's a train wreck, not that I can't win. Um, it just feels like, uh, that was, that was suboptimal. Maybe I can salvage it because I'm going to get rewarded for being like being in a ridiculous scenario where I'm like the solo or yeah, the maybe one one, yeah. I'm the one of two and the other two is on the, all the way on the other end. But oftentimes I'm just like, shit uh i guess it kind of feels like that's where i rolled the dice and it's like it didn't go my way this time you know i've got three people next to me that are forcing mm -hmm. uh forcing something and i you know i picked i picked a very powerful card in that class to start off like let's say pack one pick one you pick raw meat or something like that and then you realize you've got some forcers next to you and you're like oh shit yeah i, I mean i think the where you pivot and the cards you can play so i like to put it this way if I, I mean, if you pivot into one of one, obviously, like you're always going to get paid off. If you pivot into, <laughs> sometimes you're just going to get wrecked as well. You're going to pivot and then someone else is going to pivot at the same time. And you're going to be going from the one of two to the one of three. And, and that, that's obviously like, that's a massive downside. But if you pivot and it means that you would have ended up with two to three cards unplayable in the next two packs because you were in a one of three or a one of four and you pivot into one of two, you're, you're already going to get rewarded. You're going to get your card density back and your card quality is going to be significantly better. That's just kind of how I see pivoting, I think. It's just that you have to take the risk on it. <laughs> That's the thing. And also, there's a little bit of pack distribution pieces where it's like, maybe you wouldn't have got wrecked. Maybe the pack just might have been, you know, you mm -hmm. maybe you were going to be one of four brute and you pivoted into one of two guardian. But like, I just think the guardian quality is like a little bit lower. Had you pivoted, you know, and then the cards were slightly skewed towards brute, you might still get a little bit punished. So there's, there's all these other factors. And I think maybe some of those factors could be tightened up a little bit but mm -hmm. um i don't know i just 15 card packs man I don't yeah know. i think this is the number <laughs> so what can one come back to yeah the number one place they can um i don't know upgrade flesh and blood draft is just flexibility pivoting um giving players more agency during the draft process um yeah because right now at least for me it feels like you don't have that uh there's like two schools of thought and yeah, I mean, it just feels like forcing is uh, it's a, it can be really good sometimes, and it's not. It, I don't know. It it it, it kind of it feels a bit on rails, and that that's a very 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 common critique of flesh and blood draft, whether it is a self fulfilling prophecy or not. Um, I would like to see more flexibility in the actual drafting process. Uh, I think that that is absolutely the place where they should be trying to improve. Anyway, I think we got a little bit off of uh, Dr. Drunk's question, but that's because we have some very specific views on Limited. So it's funny. I think our views on Limited are like pretty similar when it comes to the actual draft process. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I don't think it's a hard pitch where it's like, oh, I'd like more agents during the draft process. There's not many people who are like, mm. nah, <laughs> forcing is fun. It's like, it's not. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get into the main topic. If you want to get your questions in for the Commander Cookout, you can definitely do so. We've definitely got some open slots over the next month or two. If you want to get your question and you can uh, drop them in the YouTube comments below, let us know. It is a command and cookout question. You can email us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com. If you're an Arsenal Pass patron, you can drop it into the command and cookout Patreon channel. Yeah, DM us on Twitter. What do you want to do? Let's get into the main topic. And we're talking new meta breakdown. And I kind of, when I set the notes to Brendan, I put, you can play almost anything. And I put that almost anything in the brackets. But we're going to go through a full meta breakdown. We are going to talk kind of, 
what draw am I leaving means. We're going to go over a couple of results from the weekend. I want to let's let's first of all start with what does draw am I leaving the meta mean? Uh, I think my number one thing, Brendan, we can kind of discuss this, but is just like surely shackles are off some of the slower decks in the format. Some of the decks are being held back by not being able to deal with board presence. So it makes you think of instantly decks that don't go wide or can't go wide, can't adapt to go wide. So tall decks, more attrition, control based decks and combo decks in particular, decks that want to do their own thing. I think it's really, for me, it's more the attrition, um, the attrition based decks, because right now the, I think those decks really, really struggle. Um, there are some code tall decks that do fine at Jeremiah, like Guardian. Uh, Guardian got the upgrade of the additional, uh, the additional six attack blues, and I think it really kind of swung that matchup a bit in their favor. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Uh, I think ultimately the shackles come off of almost every deck in the format because almost every deck in the format was con- was um, committing significant sideboard slots to draw mine. Yeah, yeah, I think for the most part you're right. Yeah, like maybe maybe Ko wasn't as much. Uh, maybe maybe Guardian wasn't. Like we'll see how Guardian builds adapt. I mean, you know, you look at these Guardian lists and even things like Victor, like a lot of go again attacks. You know. Doing Zealous Beltings, you know, Rouse the Ancients, E Strikes, Out Muscles, even in some builds. And and maybe that's the go forward build, right? Maybe without the Out Muscles, maybe you don't need those. But maybe that's just the go forward build because that's a lot of like three card 11s and stuff like this because of Anathos. Um, but, and, you know, four card 13s and things like this. But maybe, um, maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe that's not the way forward. So I think we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think you're kind of right. The, the attrition based decks are the interesting ones, you know, like the non. You know, like the Azuris of the Wood, mm-hmm. for instance, I think that's super interesting. So these decks that maybe want to play more of a control game plan, but don't have the, the damage output to deal with the dragons as efficiently. You know, the weapons don't efficiently deal with the dragons, I think is the interesting ones. Um, you mind if I tangent? I just want to tangent real quick. Did you see the new Victor specialization card? The blue? Yeah, that card's really good. That card is objectively not balanced. So you, if you consider yeah. that your shield is also a gold token, yep. like... <laughs> Yeah, that card is that's, hilarious. That's, that's like crazy. the it's like the best card. It's like one of the best cards I've ever seen in Flesh and Blood. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have it. On I hand. won't name names out for people, but it looks. Pretty yeah, good. yeah. Let me let me grab it out. I won't name names, but um, someone was saying that that card was uh, not very good. Mm. <laughs> who, who said that? <laughs> well, I won't name names, but it might have been someone in uh, a group that we're involved with, Brendan. Let me um, let me read out. This is Visit Goldmain Estate. It is a Guardian action. It is blue. It is a majestic. It is uh, presumably an expansion slot in uh part of the misfail because it does have the part of the misfail uh code it is a victor specialization cost one at blue defense three again as i say create a gold token then if you control three or more gold tokens or three or more gold sorry create that many might tokens mm. so uh yeah i mean if you have once you hit this fulfill this uh requirement of three gold then you create a gold or even if you just have two when you create this, you create a gold and then you also get three might tokens off of it. So yeah. one card, gold, and three might tokens. And uh, what happens when you create a three? gold in, in Victor? What happens? <laughs> you draw a card. You draw a fucking card. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's that's like, so you, if, if you don't, if you like have, if you have a memory lapse and you forget what Victor does, you read this card and you're like, oh, I guess if you get the gold plus you get the might, then I guess it's like a high value blue. It's a pretty good blue. And then you're like, wait a second. Victor's hero ability just draws a fucking card when you make a gold. What? That card, this card is so good. Like, it's one of the best blues I've ever seen. Also, blocks for three, by the way. What the hell? Um, this is going to. Kind of- <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it, it, this, this feels like an anoint. <laughs> ointment an anointment they're an anointing victor to be the golden boy of whatever set i mean it's just crazy okay so other things you should consider you make the gold here so it's gonna check that um you your shield's gonna count as a gold if you're playing that shield but you probably will be so you really only have to have one other gold on the battlefield the only argument you can make against this card is that it is a it is a whiff for clash but yes, that that's but that's not compelling <laughs> it's not. but also once you get the gold then you can use the gold to win your clashes <laughs> so i think it kind of synergizes in a way honestly and you know there's like a world where you just go like well i just start crown of dominion i just become royal i'm royal victor just so i can have i can start with two gold and play the first time i draw visit goldman estate pay my one resource the, th- the fact this isn't even like a two card for this it's like a, a, a you know a one card plus a little bit of resources yeah you know, plus my tunic whatever yep Yep. Drop my card let me, back. Let replaces me put it in itself. If, if this was a legendary and legendary in the sense that you can only play one of them, I'd still say this card is busted. But oh my god, having three of these in yeah, your deck. Them. Yeah, super powerful card. I was very surprised to see it. Um I guess Victor's back on the menu, boys. 
Yeah, I think so too. Uh, let's quickly while we're here, let's revisit the Golden Anvil, which is the other card we saw uh, as another Pop the Must Fail expansion slot card. But looks of it, it is a warrior action at Majestic. It costs zero, defense three, and is blue, and says Olympia Specialization. As an additional cost to play this, destroy X gold you control, equip X weapons and or equipment from your inventory. That's yeah. an interesting card. Uh, I, I saw don't think some it's even near as good as visit the Goldman Estate, but it's an interesting card. <laughs> yeah, I saw some interesting thing. People were talking about like blowing up their spell void. They're going to grab more, going to grab Arcane Barrier. They talk about blocking the Crown of Providence and going to grab another Crown of Providence like mm-hmm. out of the sideboard. Um, all kinds of funky stuff. What I like about this card is that it is, I think, outside of Taylor, maybe like it's a kind of a new interaction in Flesh and Blood, like being able to go like. So you've got the you've got the uh, warrior and. Um, uh, assassin one that goes and gets you a weapon mm, mm. yeah oh, but the equipment yeah. the equipment is yeah, yeah you're right you're right so, fishing equipment from your 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 sideboard is um yeah it's cool i mean i like the design space it's like one of my favorite kind of design spaces in, in uh, magic was, mastermind's was like, acquisition or some shit i don't know what that card is but like burning wish or yeah, like living, yeah, you know thing. like these yeah yeah, 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 Coming, okay. yeah okay yeah i, yeah, I yeah. think it is just called wishing but yeah 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 just wishing yeah um i like there's another one that was like they printed in like time spiral or or planet of chaos something like that, that did the same thing maybe it must be time i don't know but anyway interesting uh glittering wish maybe is the card i'm thinking of but yeah let's Before. uh <laughs> we've talked we've talked olympia and goldman special uh, victor specializations which are very interesting i think the victor one is very very strong i mean that card alone makes me want to play victor so i just don't think it's balanced go. like period i, yeah. I don't i mean we'll see how it plays out um, it might be a bit too awkward. You might need to be winning clashes and things, but often when a card looks powerful, it just, it just is powerful. Um, especially when the requirements to do it don't seem that hard to get to. All right. Draw my leave in the meta. We've talked about some of the reasons why that, you know, what that might do to the meta. I mean, Victor is, you know, if you if you don't have to worry about as many poppers and you just play more stuff like that, I'll tell you what, that's that's pretty enticing. Uh why don't we talk battle hardened results from the weekend as well? Because I think although Dromai was legal and I probably would have expected a bump in Dromai this weekend, just given, you know, kind of Dromai's last dance, it was pretty clear that, that Dromai was, was going to Living Legend and, you know, has definitely Living Legend. It is out from this coming weekend. So if you're heading to ProQuest this weekend, remember, no Dromai. It's gone. Living Legend. Uh, battle hardened results. So battle hardened Atlanta, there was actually three Dromai in the top eight, which I think makes sense. I think the other heroes in the top eight were, were quite interesting though. Two Azalea, one Prism, one Leviah, one Kasai, no mm. KO. And then there was a PTI event the next day, which I'm, I'm going to put a lot less weight into, but I think there was like a couple of viscerize in the top eight there. There was no no KO again. Um, so, yeah, it's quite it's just this format. I mean, off the back of Phuket as well, just the, the decks in this format, the width of decks, we've just never really seen anything like it. It's kind yeah. of insane. I think there's a huge bump in Azalea. I mean, obviously, Brody won the calling with it, but um, I think a lot of people are picking up that deck now as a result. So yeah. that's like the big narrative for me as Dr- obviously Dromai leaving the format is a narrative, but I think off the back of that, a lot of people are looking at Azalea um, in lieu of its recent performances. Do you think Azalea is the deck that gets the biggest bump from Dromai leaving then? Or do you just know. think it's already like one of the better decks and it, it's like the one of the better decks that gets a bump? I think it's already one of the better decks. Like I remember a lot of people telling me uh, at the Pro Tour that if they had a little bit more time, they think they they, th- they thought it was possible they'd end up on Azalea. Like it was like That's one insane. of the, yeah, <laughs> like it was one of those decks that kind of came up last minute. Maybe it was Copium, um, but sounds like it. Yeah, I think as Dromai leaves, Azalea could get better, but at the same time, the Guardians can now afford to add a lot more defense reactions in the deck, and now you have yep. to play against that matchup. Which I'm not sure how that goes, to be honest. Like I haven't visited Azalea v um, Defensive Guardian in a long time, so I'm not sure with some of the new cards that might be available, but that would be some of the meta correction that I would expect would be more defense reactions in decks to mm. uh, deal with something like Azalea. Yeah, that's interesting. I, th- I think that my, my view is the two, like two of the decks that get the biggest bump out of drama, I think Living Legend is, is Kasai. Um, and I mean, I don't say Dorinthia because I think Dorinthia was good if you played the Dawnblade plan, but Hatchet's Dorinthia. I think those two decks in particular get quite a massive bump from... The living legend of Dromai. Mm. And then the other one I'd kind of throw in there, I think, is is Prism. <laughs> um, although not necessarily that the matchup was bad, but I think if people knew about it and were prepped for it, it was it was pretty bad for for Prism if if you were ready for it. Yeah. Um, I think 
like we've talked about it ad nauseum and we talked about it last week's pod, but I, I do think that Kano gets a really big boost. Um, I think this is going to be one of the better formats for Kano. That being said, it is completely contingent on the adoption of Prism. Like if Prism becomes a top three deck, or at least a top three represented deck, which I could see mm-hmm. that happening. Um, Classic Prism plays. I think the new Prism is like a, almost a legit auto loss for Kano. It's I haven't practiced it a lot, but I mean, in theory, it just looks so bad. So uh, I've seen a few people play it. It's pretty bad. Well, with that said, why don't we go through kind of... So what I've done, Brendan, is I've, in my view, grouped some decks into some groupings of where I think of where I think they sit. I've got some little, little little names to them. And then how about you challenge me on these or we can move some around if we feel that maybe they're in the wrong spot. So I'm going to start with the top decks. Let's go top to bottom. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, let's let's save the best for last. <laughs> let's go top to bottom. I've, let's give a little hint. These are the titles I've given. I've got the top decks post Jeromei. I've got the challenges. These are the uh, the tier one, but more likely tier one to tier point, or could be tier one, but more likely tier one to tier two, or tier one point five, sorry, <laughs> to tier two. I've got the outliers. These could surprise us. These could be medium to bad in the end, but they could rise to be a tier one deck. I've got the traps. Yep, still bad to have, but uh, still bad to play, but have fun. And then I've got the rest, which is these can find a place somewhere in the middle, but they probably just have better options in their class. So let's start with the top decks. Uh, I think that heading out of Dromai, the top three just decks from a power level standpoint and the decks I'd be most sort of considering or concerned about when it came to playing at a, a high level event would be Ko, Kasai, and Kano. The case. Hmm. I am not sure. So, so like post Dromai, I think that if you go level one post Dromai, like let's say Dromai rotates today and we have a tournament mm-hmm. tomorrow. Maybe this is the top decks, but I do think that the meta starts shifting enough to where some of these decks get hated out a little bit. Um, one, of course, is the easy one we just talked about, which is Kano. So I do think that Prism mm-hmm. is going to rise in popularity a lot. Um, and it, it could it could make it a lot harder. That being said, Guardian could also rise up a bit. Um, I know a lot of people were, you know, there's a it's very divisive on is the Guardian matchup in the drum like good or not. But uh, Guardians rising up is good for Kano. But I think ultimately, like, there's just a huge narrative behind Prism right now. And mm-hmm. I actually don't know if Kano is a top deck as a result. I mean, the funny thing is, it, it feels like it's only getting one bad matchup. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. I think the KO is not a great matchup, to be fair, and a lot of these KOs are going to be playing Spell Void. I think you know a lot of people mm-hmm. in general will be having Spell Void, but I think, I think KO is a matchup where you are... If I was not hitting the Copium, you're probably unfavored. If slightly, you're probably unfavored, I think, especially if there's Spell Void on the battlefield. So I think you have yeah. two really reasonable bad matchups, um, and one being an auto loss. But yeah, I mean, th- I'd probably agree with you here, except I would... You know, with caution, maybe you know, say that Azalea is creeping up there. And I also think that Victor is very, very, very good. Victor is a deck that, I mean, I just don't think it was well positioned for the Pro Tour, but I think it's one of the best decks in the game right now. So, uh, okay, this is my okay. <clears throat> Lots of breakdown there. Let's go. Let's go Victor first. Let's answer that question because I thought about this as well. I think Victor is very powerful, but I just said Ko, Kasai, and Kano. Which of those matchups is good for Victor? Well. Let's have Prism in there. Which of those matchups is good for Victor? So at least two of them are bad. <laughs> um, at least, two, uh, <laughs> ah, at least all of them are bad, I think. My boy Victor keeps getting held down by context, but uh, yeah. yeah. The KO matchup, to be fair, isn't It's not terrible. great. It is not great. It is not great. Okay, it's so that's winnable. the best of those four matchups. I haven't. The I haven't, matchup yeah, is heard pretty bad. bad. The Kano matchup is terrible. And the Prism matchup is also pretty terrible. <laughs> You know what? You win. I, I, I concede. I think that's correct. I, think I it's want correct. Victor to be good. I think, I think I it's like correct. Victor. I do. I think it's correct. <laughs> I think I was saucing a little bit off the back of the, the, the new specialization. And yeah, that's a pretty bad murderer's row you got to play against. Yeah. We can come back to, to Victor once he's visited the estate. And yeah. uh, he's come back with the new goodies. But until then, I honestly think it's tough. So I, I kind of agree. I think Kano... I think in power level and the fact that I think you have to respect it just with how powerful I think it is, it, it, it kind of can sit in that tier one, but it might be more in this, uh, this second tier. So, you know what? I think on the back of our discussion, I'm going to drop us down to our second tier. Yeah. And then um, we go ahead, you- now we got space, so we can go ahead and move Bolton up to top deck. Yeah, of course. Uh, actually, I was going to get Riptide in there. Let's talk KO Kasai quickly. I mean, my view is that KO just lost one of its harder matchups in Dromai. Like, I actually just think that was a bad matchup for KO. And 
I don't think KO has many bad matchups, honestly, and it just lost that. I think what is tough is that people can try and target KO. Ultimately, I just think KO is like best deck in format. I just think it's because of its true power level, it is just the default to start with and you have to beat KO. KO doesn't have to beat. KO is just going to deal damage. It's going to be super efficient. It's going to do its thing. And if you don't have a plan into it, it's going to beat you probably most of the time. And even if you do have a plan into it, it's probably still going to beat you a, a big amount of the time. So mm. like getting into the PT, people, you know, KO was the deck to beat. And these are pro players coming in against the deck to beat. And I think a lot of people identified that Jerome was a good matchup. They had a good matchup into KO. I don't think people identified that many other things had a good matchup into to KO, honestly. Um, you know, people talking about like Katsu and, you know, these kind of decks and stuff and Bolton. And yeah, Bolton does have a good matchup into KO, but that deck is not particularly great. So I just think the decks that are probably good into KO, like have good natural game plans into KO, they're just not going to be well represented, honestly. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think KO gets slightly stronger on the aggregate maybe around the same and kasai i just think it's a massive bump from drama going you get to cut all these crappy cyber cards you talk to matt dilks about it you get to cut a bunch of these cyber cards you get to add in you know more uh, attack reactions or more ways to make sure you guarantee that goal for your raisin army which is just an insane card i, I just think kasai gets such a bump mm -hmm. kale's an interesting one it's like a very disorienting deck to <laughs> try to evaluate because i feel like even pre uh before the pt there was like a like we genuinely believe the ko is the best deck literally since the set dropped and mm -hmm. maintain that belief but there is a strong fun of you there's yes there is a strong narrative that ko is not the best deck that it's overrated it's not that good and i feel like i'm getting echoes of that again now post pt the ko is not as good you know like look at look at how well the warriors did you know jeremiah has gone it unlocks all these decks so I think that people are still doubting KO despite its performance at the Pro Tour. But my evaluation in testing and at the Pro Tour is that it is just the best deck in Flesh and Blood. Doesn't mean it wins every game, doesn't mean it had it had not. best matchups. But it was just like I felt like its matchup spread was fantastic and it was just it just did the most damage turn over turn. In in a like semi balanced mid game, when you know, when there's not just broken stuff happening. Meta games are self-corrective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a deck that is the strongest deck is going to have the most representation of decks trying to put a target on it and beat it. So with cyber cards, with with game plans geared specifically towards it, doesn't mean it's still not the most powerful strategy. And I just think that's where KO sits. Now, ultimately, I think Warrior is, this is where I think KO is, why I say KO doesn't necessarily just get a massive bump from Dromite going. I think Warrior is good into, into KO, particularly Kasai and... Um, and Dorinthia. So, you know, maybe that's a maybe Warriors just dominate and KO just isn't isn't good enough because of it. But I still think even that matchup is like, you know, 60% at worst. Um, so mm -hmm. I think KO and Kasai are the, the top two decks. I mean, there's an argument that maybe, you know, do you want to talk argument? You said Azalea could maybe be in here, maybe Prism, maybe Dorinthia. Are those the three? I think zero percent chance Prism is up there. I think Prism is yeah, a is a challenger deck. Like I think it's a good deck. Um yeah. It's really interesting to me. Like Prism is a really interesting deck to me. I absolutely would not put it in this is a top deck uh right now. Mm -hmm. But it could I, I could just not know enough about the deck. Like context changes, Dromai leaves the format, people have better Prism lists, people are better at the the hero. Um just for me, it's not like when I think of the top decks that you could be playing, I don't see Prism as like the deck to beat quite yet. Um, although it is an interesting yeah. pick to me. It's super powerful. I think inherently, you know, there's there's the the fail safe, the the button built into Prism. It starts at a low life total. Mm -hmm. It has a bunch of cards that don't block. Obviously, it can do absurd things. I think the more people play with it, the people, the better people are going to get with it. But also, the better people are going to get is playing against it and playing those strategies. And I think just naturally, the strategies that work well into Prism are pretty simple to enact. I think, and I think, you know, for instance, attacking with your KO deck. It's pretty pretty good into, into Prism, so I think I agree. Let's go through these challenges that the could be Tier 1s, but more likely Tier 1.5 to 2. Uh, at the moment, we've put KO down there. Prism's sitting in there. We've got Azalea, Victor, Dorinthia, and I've got Dash IE yeah. in there. said KO, by the way, I think you meant Kano. We put I mean Kano. It's too many freaking K here. So Kano, Prism, Azalea, Victor, Dorinthia, Dash, and Venture Extraordinaire. Do you want to go at any of these? Uh, Dash Inventor Extraordinaire seems like a bit of a... Bit of a stretch? Uh, oh, well, sorry, I was thinking Dash IO, but let's, oh. let, let's talk about Dash Inventor Extraordinaire. Um... Good K matchup. Yeah, it had a bad, bad Jeremiah matchup. 
right? Uh, no, no. Like it's it's dramatic. It wasn't wasn't terrible. I think the the problem I think that Dash has is that the boost Dash plan is its best plan by a mile because the value built into decks now means that when you go on the item plan, it's really hard to get enough value out of the long game of your deck because just decks are just more powerful than they were when the item plan was 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 good value and to get enough value out of it you have to take the game super long and decks just aren't going to let you do that or they're going to accrue enough value in the early game that you're going to run you low on cards because they're going to attack you a bunch um, or they're still going to have ways to finish the game so i think dash in the extraordinary's best plan is when it can leverage high octane to a massive degree it can leverage Ticklo core it can leverage spark of genius like these cards are kind of busted honestly but if you can't leverage those cards you have to play an item plan I you've play into defensive decks like Guardian or even like Warrior. I think it's tougher. I think that's where it's tougher. But yeah, I mean, look, Dromai Dr- Dr- was a, a bad matchup for Dash, but not not significantly. It was like a 55, 60 matchup for Dromai Vess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what hero do you think people would disagree with you on? Like, what, what, what do you, because this seems like a pretty tame list. Like, this seems pretty I straightforward. What, what do you think is the hot take here? I don't think there's any particular, but Dash, maybe not having um, Azalea in tier one because Brody's been winning with it. People will probably kick off about that. You know? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I, I think if I talk just to Dash a little bit more, I, I think the reason I put Dash here is that it just inherently is powerful. Like those cards I just talked about, Spark of Genius, Tech Low Core, um, being able to start with turning all your blues to four damage in your deck, you know, with the, the item play um, to start with. You know, Tickler Pounder, being able to search out an item on turn zero to get extra equity. Uh, I just think, and also the flexibility, like Dash is just inherently just has to be up here, I think. It just, there's no way it can't be. It's just too powerful, I think. It might not be best position in the way the metagame evolves, and it might just be solid tier two, but I think there's a chance that Dash continues to, or, you know, Dash always wins stuff. People get surprised. Like, oh, Dash won this. Like, yeah, Dash is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the outliers. You want, to talk, you want to talk anything else in the challenges? You want I don't to talk? Think, I, uh, I, I don't think does it's Victor that's... belong here. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, the meta is uh, okay. It's a little hostile to Victor, but Victor is one of the. It's so powerful. It's one of the best heroes in Flesh and Blood. It just happens that the meta game is not super, not super great for it right now. You wait until we get visit whatever the fuck. You wait. It's gonna be a Victor. When you hit to the estate. I can't believe they're giving that card to Victor. I already think Victor is kind of busted. Not busted enough though. I, I think I can quickly just split. I think what this tier 1.5 to 2 is, is like powerful decks that may not be as strong in the meta game. Like that's what I think this is. Like it's apart from maybe Dorinthia. And I think that's just, it's just well positioned in the meta. That's the one deck I think is kind of an outlier. But Kano, Prism, Azalea, Victor, and Dash, and Victor Extraordinary. I think those are just powerful decks that are a little bit less powerful than, or around the same power level as like Kasai but are just slightly worse in the meta right now. And then KO and Kasai, I just think, have good meta positions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think Dorinthia is also in a good meta position, but is not as good as Kasai. So it sits in this challenges tier. That's I feel like that, that's a hot take though, right? Surely that, that's That Kasai is better than... Yes, because people ask me this. They're like, oh, you know, Dorinthia put multiple decks into the top eight at the Pro Tour. I'm like, yeah, I mean, they did. Kasai also won the calling, let's not forget, uh, and had two, two Kasais in, in top eight. I think ultimately, I think the reason that I have... Um, Kasai higher is that I think with Dromai leaving, what is the best two-handed or like two-weapon warrior deck? It's the one that has this insane broken, two broken specializations. Do you know what I mean? Like one of the, str- in terms of Blood on Her Hands and, um, and Raise an Army. And what Dorinthia ultimately has is not that. And Dorinthia, the more people play it and understand how to play into it, like it's a value deck and it's a Valiant Dynamo deck. It's a value deck. But if you compare Spill Blood and cleave to blood on her hands and raise an army uh, i'll tell you and, and the hero ability that lets you make gold and also gives your weapons free attacks i'll tell you which one i'm taking yeah <laughs> i just think kasai is just better fair enough fair enough you want to talk outliers yeah. so these are the could be surprises or could just kind of be medium to bad in the end uh in this tier brendan and i'll explain in a couple of these we've got viscerai we've got katsu we've got azuri and we've got Dash IO. Now IO is coming in. What do you want to start? I think it's a fair evaluation of Dash IO. It could definitely surprise, but uh, I think in a metagame that's prepared for Dash IO, it's like really not a good deck. Um, 
I, maybe it's just not built correct, but that that has been one hundred percent my experience with Dash IO. Is like if if a deck is prepared for it, it's like it does almost nothing. I think Azuri is absolutely ripe to come back into this metagame poster of my um, as one of these more. I don't know if there's multiple ways to build Azuri, but there is. There's yeah. like an attrition way to build it, which I think is particularly interesting. I think multiple attrition decks are actually pretty interesting. Just like, do mm-hmm. you auto lose to Kano? Do you auto lose to the Kasai Endgame? Um, Prism. Yeah, Prism, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. Katsu, obviously I mean, very powerful. Katsu doing broken things on stream now for multiple weeks. Um, <laughs> and then the outlier you have here is Viserai. So, okay, yeah, I good. I think let's we can talk about all these heroes. Let's like, let's talk about Viserai last. Let's quickly just cover these. Dash, I, I mostly agree with you, except for the fact that I think it's still probably a little bit underexplored. It's such a complicated hero. The game states it gets involved into is probably the most complicated in any of the heroes in Flesh and Blood currently. And that's why I think I have it as an outlier. Like if someone can break dash IO, can find the right metagame to play it in. I mean, we saw Tom like almost go undefeated to win a calling, you know, obviously falls in the final. And yes, a part of that was like people not understanding how the deck worked. But honestly, also that the deck is just is really powerful, I think. And in the right metagame, um, like you talk about, you know, maybe a Guardian metagame is not the one for it. But a bunch of mid-range decks is probably pretty good for dash IO um katsu yeah i think ultimately what holds katsu down is everyone having fridges yeah. uh and the fact you can run out of density but you know we you know we saw pudding at um the coin bouquet the other week take it to a semi-final i think like katsu is strong and has good combo lines obviously now it's gotten better azuri is interesting i think you're right the attrition piece my question really comes down this is my big question with azuri is like if i'm going to play a two-handed uh, you know, two weapon deck like Azuri, should I just be playing Warrior? Is mm-hmm. Warrior just better? That's kind of my question right now. Like, I've got Valiant Dynamo, I've got access to all this stuff. Like, is there a reason I should actually be playing Azuri over over a Warrior or a Guardian? That's going to be my question. And then <clears throat> Viserai. Do you know what deck has the second highest win rate after Dromai on Teleshot right now? Well, I know now because it's a leading question, but uh, what's this? <laughs> <sighs> The efficacy of Talishar data, like so okay, we can. Do, yeah, do we believe in Talishar now? This. I feel like we haven't yeah. we haven't lent much to it in the past, but well, but this is the thing. What deck had um, surprisingly the second best win rate on Talishar before the PT, Brendan? Which one? I don't know. Dorinthia. And people were like Dorinthia. You know, like these decks come out of nowhere, and then it's not like they come out of nowhere. You can actually look to some of these stats as some indicators. I think leading indicators of where they might wind up. <clears throat> um, and I think there's a reason, I'm not saying, like, I'm not saying Viserae is tier one. I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be one of the best decks, but I think the reason it's a bit of a surprise package is because, actually, sorry, I lied, it's the third highest win rate. It's the second of the legal heroes. Victor has a slightly higher win rate, so maybe there's something in that, Brendan. But um, but it's a 54% win rate on, on Talashar, which, you know, like, uh, Gary, Talashar is not everything, but there's a couple of ways to build Viserae right now. There's more traditional way with just, like, you know, non-attack actions, attack actions, attacking on two axes with the um arcane damage and the the physical damage and i think that's pretty good in this meta i think it's really hard to be able to deal with split damage there's a lot of mid-range decks in the the environment for Sarai, typically very good in those and also i know rosetta thorn's gone but prior to rosetta thorn being gone the deck looked basically the same it's actually had a few upgrades and what was holding it down was ice right i think ice was pretty significantly holding down for Sarai. and without that I, I think that kind of game plan is pretty solid the other game plan is this like kind of semi combo decks, whether they're full combo like Turtle Up Rune Chant decks or they're like Looming Doom decks. And you can play somewhere in between. I, I think Viserai, I don't think we've seen the, the best build of Viserai out there yet, but I actually think Viserai is, is potentially a, a deck that could surprise a lot this Pro Quest season and could be a deck that kind of sits around as like an underlayer waiting to win an event with someone building the right list and it's staying under the radar. All right, we've covered the outliers, surprises, but maybe might just end up being medium. <laughs> Let's talk traps, Brendan. Um, they might be fun, but I'm almost certain they're still going to be absolutely terrible. Mm. On my list, I've got uh, <clears throat> Riptide, Teclavossen, Arachne, Olympia, Vincent. I've got Bolton. I <clears throat> Look, I think Bolton is probably the best deck in this group, um, but I think it is still significantly worse than the other Warriors and and a bit of a trap. I think that Bolton is not a trap. I think it's, uh, I think it's like if I, I would put it on the lowest on, on the bottom of challengers. Actually, that's where I put it. I, I do think it's worse than the other world. Oh, you wouldn't even put in outliers. You put in challenges. 
I think they're so. higher than Katsu or... I mean, they're not we're saying higher, like they're different. They're not tiers, right? But higher, like, I guess effectively higher than Katsu, Azuri, Dasha. Yeah, I think so. Um, not That doesn't mean it's necessarily more powerful, but I think it has a decent KO matchup. It's got a nice fridge and... Yeah, uh, I, I honestly, I don't think the deck is very, very powerful. I just, uh, I don't think it's like a crazy underdog anymore, you know? Like, it's no longer mm. just like this ro- this role play meme. It's fine. It does mid-rangey things. It has decent damage curves. And it's, it's sorry, and its fridge is really good. I just can't see any reason to play. Like, all the decks in, like, the outlier section, I'm like, there's reasons to play this that the top, two kind of tiers we spoke about the challenges and the top decks can't do whereas bolton i'm like multiple other decks can do this you know the two other warriors can do this i think but maybe if you're looking for like a deck that can swap combo plan like maybe that's a reason to play it maybe warriors are so good that even if you're the worst warrior is still like a tier two deck well olympia no that deck is trash from what i've heard i haven't played it but all I've right heard it's I, I do watch i would i would i would move bolton out of this uh traps tier but uh how about how about outliers? How about it's an outliers? Could be could okay. be good, probably medium. Yeah, I, I guess so. It's not going to surprise anybody though, because everybody knows you go to an event, Bolton's showing up. It depends you what events you're going to. I'm playing the Pro Tour, mate. Uh, <laughs> hey, it showed up to the Pro Tour too somehow. Did it? I didn't see it. Yeah. Actually, I was at the bottom table, so I should have seen it really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I think the other ones though, Riptide, Tickleboss, and Arachne, Olympia, and Vincent, I think those are pretty safe as houses mm-hmm. in this uh, traps. Yeah, don't play. The next list the rest. is the most controversial. Well, this is the rest. I think this is like, they could be fine. There's like a, an outside chance they have in the place in the meta, but what I ultimately think this list is, is that there are better options in the class that these heroes play in. So these are Bravo, Betsy, Vi, Leviah, Reinar, and Max. I think these decks could potentially be good. I think there's better options. And I honestly think Reinar is Reinar and Levi are probably the outliers here where they, they they could be better than you know, they, they could be better than KO. There's a world where they're better than KO, but Yep. Um Well, I mean, I gotta believe in my boy Michael Yasker on Levi, so there's something there. There's something there. People there are there is a non zero amount of people that legitimately think that Bravo is better than Victor. Like that's a real thing. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it is. Yeah. I'm sure there's a non-zero amount of people who <laughs> think a lot of things. Bro, I've been... I've... <coughs> I got him. Uh, I'm dying on this hill. Um, I remember saying that about Victor when it first came out. I felt like you didn't, you didn't believe me. I felt like you thought that Bravo was I didn't say better. Victor wasn't a better deck. I just I think Bravo had a better meta position at that time for attacking, attacking KO. And I, I honestly think if your like, goal is to just beat KO, I think you're going to have a better chance of doing that with, with just Bravo than victor in its current state although to be fair i think some of the more recent lists of victor that have targeted ko look pretty good right like you just yeah i I mean i think it looks pretty reasonable but ultimately the hero is a clash hero gets value out of clash and gold and ko has the highest numbers and the most biggest average numbers so unless you can build a deck full of all attacks which i think just makes your victor deck worse so yeah i don't know i mean my my argument is i don't think that crippling crush is is uh i don't think it's enough because I do not like the Bravo here ability. Not that I wouldn't use it, and it doesn't have like it does. It doesn't do things sometimes. I just like when you compare that to make a gold draw a card. They're just. But they're, you're not making a golden drawing the card. That's the thing. Like when are you making a golden drawing card against KO? That's kind of my point in that matchup. It's a, like, I agree like, with you on the whole. Above thirty percent of the time, or something. If you play the deck that's like all attack actions basically, and so your deck is kind of trash, and you probably just lose anyway. I like. You're like close to forty five or something, close to fifty percent. But like, otherwise, you're like twenty percent. Yeah. Um. Still, so I'm talking aggregate, not just about KO. I, I think the crippling crush is not sure. enough, and I think the hero ability of Victor is just like infinitely better, and that's enough. Like, I, I don't know the argument. Really, On the aggregate, uh, agree. yeah. Argument actually doesn't go past that. It's just two points. Crippling crush not enough. Victor hero ability better. You either agree or disagree on one of those, and if you do, that's how you come to the conclusion that Bravo is potentially better. Outside of that. They're just like the same thing. 
there's a little bit of a bit more nuance than that but yeah, what's the new yeah, what do you what do you think is it like well, uh, you you have you have other cards right like you're not just playing yeah, so you time. because because of clash to get the value out of your hero ability you can play other cards in in bravo like like star shark play, as well as another special yeah the aura as well you know the blue aura um from welcome drake like so you you can you have a little bit more deck flexibility because you don't have to be winning these clashes and things like that so you don't have to you know all your blues don't have to be you know power attacks like attack actions um, also, especially with drama going away, yeah. you know, Bravo can even be a little more flexible. But I, I mostly, I mostly agree with you. I think on the aggregate, I don't think it's particularly close. I think Victor is just the better guardian. But yeah, if I was trying to specifically only beat KO, Bravo might be the way I went. Yeah, yeah. Bravo does. Like, I do think Bravo, but it, like the most polarizing matchup, I think Bravo is like probably way better against like Fi or something like that. Yes, or Ninja. Yeah. 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 Um, like there's basically what I'm saying. I think there's a world where Bravo is the better choice over Victor, but I think Victor is the better hero, <laughs> I and that's why Bravo is in this class. Yeah, and I Betsy, well, yeah, I don't know. I think Betsy is just the worst of the three games. Although, you know, Betsy might not be terrible, but um, I think Fire. I think Katsu right now is just the better ninja. It has the better tools. Uh, I think Fire is in a bit of a, a weird spot. It doesn't particularly play well into this meta. And then Max, I think Max actually could be decent, honestly. Like if like as a as a combo deck, as a as a um a mech suit deck. The problem is Brute's just got all the space freed up from some extra poppers to be able to play at six attacks that don't block, like I don't know, smashing performance, for instance. Um so I yeah, I think Max sits in this tier for me. And then Le- Levi and Ryan are the two like that I think could potentially be outliers. I think Reinar is still really good. I think this could even be like a tier two deck. And I think the same of Levi. I just I just think Levi is kind of reminds me like Levi and Dash IO sit so close to me as like these decks that are powerful, but why play a deck that's just as powerful as another thing, but you lose to yourself a, a section of the time. <laughs> like that's like that's exactly how I feel about Bravo and Bolton, where it's just like I do feel like there's almost objectively better decisions in the class, like better choices, like better. At least they don't lose to themselves though. They yeah, just lose to being that. a worse version of the deck. <laughs> the the Max one is interesting to me. Max is just a hero I know nothing about. Like I didn't even yeah, indulge okay. in like learning the combo or anything yet. Like it just hasn't been relevant. So um it's a hero I'd like to be good, but yeah. I've played so much Max. Yeah. Yeah, the Max. I think the guy. problem with Max is yeah, just like dying to smashing performances and you know, um arc smashes and stuff that people can kind of put back into their deck a bit more freely. Um and you know, I don't think like you're Kano matchup is that great? Mm-hmm. I don't think your prison matchup. Except, like I just think there's, it's a bit tough for for Max. Um, right. And you can play Dash and just get all the power cards. So why not do that? So here is a question: You're traveling. You're you're going away for weeks at a time. Mm. What, what, what deck's going in your backpack? Uh, so this is the question. I have to decide this probably tonight because uh, I'm packing my bag. I think, dude. Honestly, I think Rhyna is going in the bag. I think I'm just going to play Rhyna. I think that's. I uh, think Rhyna and Kasai are going in the bag. Why not Kano? Uh, I don't enjoy playing Kano, honestly, that much. I mean, I, I, I do enjoy playing Kano, but not enough that I want to play it over other things and enough that I want to fight through the hate that I'm expecting people to play. Um, Kano for me is always, like, Kano for me has been an opportunistic choice, I think. It was at Worlds, it was at PT1, it was, you know, when I've played it otherwise. But I've, I've only registered that deck three times, I think, maybe even twice. Once for a PQ, maybe, maybe not even PQ. Is there any like other deck you registered more at a pro tour at like a tier four event? Drama. How many times? Tier three and four. Well, no, tier uh, four. Just tier a, four. Just tier four. Same, equal. equal. Twice at <laughs> tier four. But Drama, I have registered three, four, three times, four times at a at a tier three event. Four times. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, Oops. I'd I'll play K now. Um, I think that I like Kano's position post Drama. Um. Yeah. Yeah, Surprise. sure, I might run into some prisms. Whatever. Say la vie. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Just um, kill them. Yeah, just kill them. Lol. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Since every Kano play ever. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, but for me, it's just the funnest here in Flesh and Blood. I love... Like, I have a screen... Sh- I, have a, I have a picture I took at the Pro Tour where I had my last Blazing Aether crippling crushed away. And yes, I was playing as Bravo. Um... And I had to do a non terministic combo, and I opted 12 cards to two Aether Spindles, and I drew eight cards. So mm-hmm. you really can't get I mean, that, that experience anywhere else. That yeah, is you fun. really that can't is get that experience anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> and my opponent's like, cards in hand, I'm like, 
nine. <laughs> <laughs> I still reminisce over, you know, like Viserai, Scalata, yeah. Sonata combo, right? Like, I, I do miss the days of being able to- I, I would say at least once every two weeks, maybe once a, a month, I hop on February, look through all the heroes and go, okay, what kind of combo deck can I play? Yeah. <laughs> Viscerai uh, Blitz, big, baby. Did you see what Pablo played at the PT? He played like Claw, Block Out, Blood Rush kind of no. Intimidate combo dot deck. I like, saw him the at the pre-round. I sit next to him because Patrick Pintor. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm off, often sitting next to him and Tark, but or near them. But yeah, he's. I was like, what are you on? He's like, Reinar. And he's like, I think it was a bad choice. I was like, okay, okay. So I never got to actually see the list, but I, I, he was definitely sweating the choice the, the, night, the, the day of. He's playing like nine barraging beat down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, he could just play KO. His teammates play KO, but yeah. He did super well though, right? He did. I think he finished 17th or something just okay. outside of top 16. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, but he's Pablo, so, you know. He is Pablo. I still haven't played against Pablo. He's like... Neither have I actually. Yeah, uh, need to play against Pablo. Yeah. All right. That's going to do it. Those are our, our groupings, our... I don't want to say tiers because they're not really... I, I honestly think even like the challenges and the outliers, that's not like tier two and tier three. I think that's like all sit around tier 1.5 to tier 2 if you want to look at it that way. I, I do think KO and Kasai are like the two best decks in the format. But there's other decks that can can challenge that, I think, and, and be really relevant choices. I think if I was to say KO Kasai, I think after that, the Kano, Prism, Azalea, Victor, Dorinthia, Dash, IE of the world are, are significantly decent choices for Pro Quest Season. And then I wouldn't blame people for playing Viserai, Katsu, Azuri, Dash, IO, or even maybe Bolton, Brendan. Everything else, I think you have to have a really good reason to play. I think I've got a good reason to play Reiner, though, which is I, I want to play Reiner. <laughs> uh, it's I'm like no, Kasai. It's the worst. Kasai. Oh, you're playing Kasai. Yeah, it's like the worst reason. I think you should have fun at ProQuest, whatever. You're not going to Amsterdam. I don't think I'm going to Amsterdam. So, like, it does not, doesn't there's matter. There's a non zero chance I go to Amsterdam. Oh, my God. Man. He's locked. He's going. <laughs> That's how it is every time. <laughs> what what changed? Uh, I've, I really enjoy traveling for Fab and playing Flesh and Blood events. I'd, I'd love to. I also actually you know what's changed is I feel like results wise, it's been a tough start to the year. Um, started with like punting away my, I don't know, punting away, but you know, I, I owe three, I lost three win ins in a row at, at the calling in uh, New Zealand and then had a pretty horrid PTLA from a results standpoint. So I'm just, I'm eager to do well at something, you know, that's honestly what's driving me a little bit at the moment. Okay. Okay. Well, sounds good. Anyway, uh, speaking of media and movies, because we have a few more minutes, I started watching Fallout. By the way, they came out with it in the Amazon. Oh yeah, it's pretty good. It's really good. It's, you oh, would like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. Okay. I recommend. That, I was avoiding. Way. Yeah, I thought it might be bad. Usually, I just finished usually Three Body are, Problem. To be fair, usually they are. Okay. I also uh, this is going to sound sacrilegious. I also started The Sopranos. Never seen it. Just started. Oh, uh, so good. Yeah. So good. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, movies and TV. Usually not a movie TV guy. So you want to say a little tidbit about me? Um, like I am so just hyperactive or just like can't sit still that I literally can only watch like sometimes 70% of the episode and I got to like kind of like get up and like fucking, I'm like, it, it. I just cannot sit there. It's crazy. Even for the best ones. Um, so getting through Fallout has been tough for me, but I've enjoyed it so far. Also listen yeah. to uh, listen to some YouTube videos about the lore. All the different vaults lore. I was falling asleep that last night while I was dying because I'm so sick. But it was cool. I might anyway. check it out. I finished um three body problem. I, I that's it's it's solid. It's not as good as I wanted it to be, um, from what I heard from the books. But yeah, that's it's solid. Awesome. Well, if your favorite piece of media is Arsenal Pass, the one thing you can do <laughs> is leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can check us out on YouTube at YouTube.com/slash at Arsenal pass um hit that subscribe while you're there twitter's our brand abg fan underscore dale and a special thank you to all the arsenal pass patrons they get access to all the additional pieces that come with those deck techs so written sideboard guides tips and tricks um everything you need to pick up the deck and be successful with it at pro quest season thank you all so much for listening we'll see you next week peace